Hi, uh, Tony Fowle. Uh, since I posted the last video about uh, using the milling machine to make some printed circuit boards and uh, in, in particular the vacuum chuck to hold them down, uh, I've been asked to uh, do another video to explain a little bit more about how in the hobby home workshop uh, you can make electrical circuits with particular emphasis of course on uh, making printed circuit boards. Uh, there are several methods that are well within the capabilities of uh, the home workshop. Uh, but first of all, let's have a close-up uh, look at some different methods. When you first uh, want to produce some sort of circuit, uh, it's quite usual to make a, a prototype first so that you can just test that it works correctly. Uh, now, one of the easiest ways for uh, doing that is to use uh, little boards like this which are known as uh, breadboards as, as you can see they've got a series of holes in them now on each side there's two rows of holes which are marked um, minus and plus minus and plus now all of the holes down in one column are connected together and again the same applies to all of those four but they're not connected across to one another. Uh, these are normally used as a power supply rails, so you connect a, a, a battery or a phone charger or a bench power supply uh, to these so that you've got the power. The part in the middle, which is divided into two separate pieces, is where you place the components, and you can see various components are plugged in here. This is the beauty of it. Um, I've got a capacitor here, I can just simply plug it in and there's a connection made and underneath the top plastic there are uh, conductive sockets. Uh, now with these, uh, there's five across, each of those five are connected together. So if you want some components coming together at a common point, you can plug them in any of those five holes across here. The two halves are separated from one another. Uh, it's also very useful these. The, the holes are spaced such that little microcontrollers uh, like uh, this uh, miniature Arduino can be plugged in across and then you can connect directly to that. So very very handy for prototyping and proof of concept. The next stage up from there, if you actually want to wire something up permanently but don't want to go to the trouble of um, making a printed circuit board, you can get uh, boards like this which are perforated with holes at a 0.1 of an inch pitch and on one side is just a plain board and you can put your components through on there. Now on the other side around each of the holes is a little ring of copper which we can solder to. So here I've uh, put this capacitor through from this side, I can solder it in place here. So that gives us a permanent uh, circuit and this is an example of um, uh, one that I've, I've got a miniature Arduino mounted at the top. I've got this white thing as a little stepper motor with a pointer on and this is used for a rev counter. There's a few other components here uh, which are there for um, uh, conditioning the signal that comes from the spark plug. This is a rev counter for a motorcycle. Um, on the other side you can see all the wiring which had to be done by hand. If you had to make e even just say half a dozen of them it would be tedious to do all this wiring by hand and um, it would be prone to error as well. So the next stage up is some form of printed circuit board. But back in the 80s I needed to make about half a dozen each of these. Now what they are, this is uh, a circuit for a rev counter again and this one is for a speedometer. I made these little drilling jigs, you can see the, the, the holes in them and 
I had a, a, a small handheld drill like uh, this, it's battery powered and will spin up to, it says, uh, 14,500 RPM. Uh, now the holes that you normally drill through for the components are generally speaking less than a millimeter. I would place a drilling jig first of all onto the piece of printed circuit board and just simply drill through all the holes by hand. Very easy. Once I had the holes in place I would use those as a guide to draw tracks onto the basic printed circuit board. That would prevent those areas under the tracks that I had drawn from being etched away and then this would be popped into an etching solution. And now as you know I've um, started making uh, small printed circuit boards uh, by isolation milling which we'll look at a bit closer as we go through the video. If we want to have some printed circuit board then probably the easiest way of doing that is to get somebody else to do it for you. Now that's not quite as silly as it sounds because now with the internet and uh, modern machinery there are dozens and dozens of uh, small companies that are willing to make one or for small production runs of printed circuit boards. Basically all you need to do is prepare the uh, files for their machinery, email that to them, pay them some money and in a fairly short while you'll get a packet with the very nicely made printed circuit boards in. But if you're intent on making it yourself and uh, there's a lot of satisfaction for some people in, in that, then we basically have two methods. There's etching, which is probably most used. Secondly, there's isolation milling. Now it's called isolation milling because basically what we do with the milling is we mill around the tracks that we want for, to carry the current and isolate them away from the others. Now the basic uh, methods of etching are very simple in principle. All we have to do is mask off the areas of copper that we want to keep for the to, to carry the current in in the circuit and etch away the remainder so all we need to do is to have some method of masking off the areas that we want to keep now that can be as simple as if we've got a printed circuit board piece of material here just with a permanent marker if I draw a line on it like so to carry the, if, if this is the track we want to keep, to carry the current from here to here and maybe we have another one here for example and uh, something going across there. Now if I put that in an etching solution, this is the most common one, ferric chloride, dangerous chemical. It says causes burns and corrosive and poison on the uh, on, on the label. However, that's a fairly crude method of doing it, and uh, it just wouldn't be applicable to uh, printed circuit boards, for example, such as uh, this computer networking card. There are a lot of methods uh, that have been developed which we can use to get much nicer. Um, masking uh, to make our printed circuit board. With the advent of the uh, desktop computer and printers and uh, technology like that, uh, there's a large number of methods that are used, one of which called toner transfer, which involves printing out an image of the printed circuit board on a laser printer to transfer the toner onto the printed circuit board and then the toner will mask off the area. Uh, I've seen uh, people um, have modified things like 3D printers and cheap uh, CNC milling machines to actually hold a marker pen and draw the circuit. Commercially 
the main way of uh, producing the masking is through photographic process and basically with that with the printed circuit board you can either buy it that's got a photo resist coating on or else you can get a spray you, you can put uh, say a mask that's been printed onto um, transparent uh, plastic sheet on top of that expose it to ultraviolet light and then you put it into a special developing solution which develops that and then you can put it into the ferric chloride etching solution to take away the copper. It's quite an involved process but the beauty of that is you can make very very detailed circuit boards in that way. You can have very fine tracks. Some people also use inkjet printers to print directly onto the printed circuit board. Now you can buy um, inkjet printers that will print onto a CD or DVD. So the simplest way is if your printed circuit board that you want is smaller than a DVD, you can just simply put that in the drawer, put it in and print directly on it. Um, other people go to great lengths to get a standard um, inkjet printer and modify it so that instead of pulling the paper in through rollers it uh, prints onto the printed circuit board. If you search the internet you'll find a whole stack of detailed information on all of the different methods of uh, making the, uh, printed circuit boards either uh, milling or etching. Whichever method you use uh, for etching the printed circuit board you still have the problem of drilling the through holes. Now if, you, if you've got a CNC rotor or CNC milling machine, even a, a fairly cheap one, uh, that is the simplest way and easiest way of uh, drilling the hole. You feed the machine with um, a, a file with instructions to uh, drill the holes in the appropriate uh, places. Uh, if you haven't got that, then you've got the rather tedious job of having to drill them by hand, uh, which I know <laughs> very well from past experience. Okay, so the uh, other method of producing uh, circuit boards is through isolation milling. Uh, now, I, I covered that with some um, e examples of it being done in part one of... Uh, if, if you read on the internet of uh, other people's experience of doing this, a common theme through most of it that I've read is that the printed circuit boards don't lay down flat and in fact there's some software that you get which will map the surface of the printed circuit board while it's sitting on the bed of the milling machine and then it will take the, the G code which is the uh, instructions for the CNC milling machine it will take that and adjust it to allow for the variation in height of the different parts when the machines going over it. Now I, I was fairly unconvinced uh, for the need for this and I couldn't understand why the, the boards didn't lay flat because every printed circuit board that I've got around here if I measure it up they're very very accurate in thickness and if I put them on a surface plate they were also very very flat but if you look at the way in which uh, mostly they're held down onto the milling table, they're generally clamped in a couple of places. Well that will distort the board, press it down where the clamps are and probably make it curl up where they're not. So you don't have a terribly flat board. This was what led me to think about using a vacuum holding down method and if you see part one of the video you will see how I actually check to see how flat it was. To mill away at the isolation tracks it's pretty obvious because we want those to be very narrow that we have to have a very small tool and I use cutting tools like this which is known as a, a D cutter. That's because if we look at the end of it the solid part looks like a D. The, the round shank is cut away here so it's flat approximately halfway through and then looking at it from the other, other view it comes to a point which is the point is a little bit off center 
so that when it rotates it actually cuts a fine groove so the point comes around like this and as it moves along it cuts the now, track. If we're running with such small cutters it's best to run them at very high revolutions in order to get sufficient surface speed. What I use and the, probably the best way of doing it is to get a very high speed spindle. The one that I've got will spin it uh, up to 24,000 rpm. Now uh, whether we have a low cost uh, simple CNC milling machine or a industrial machine there's a common feature both of them we need to have some code generated in order to drive the machine and for that we need software now there's software on several different levels and in most cases you can, there isn't just one program that will do it all for you you need to do this in this one this and another uh, the, the first thing that you need to do is obviously design your circuit and then in some cases but not all with the software you need to enter that schematic um, graphically into the software help you produce it won't do it all for you but depending on how sophisticated the software is it'll do a lot of it uh, for the actual layout of the components which comply with that schematic that you've put in and then uh, some of them have what's called auto routing it will try and arrive at the best routes for the conductive tracks to take to uh, keep the board as simple as possible and in many many cases in order to make it possible that you can make the board that you want. A uh, result that you want from any of this software is a file that you can feed into your machine. Now a lot of the uh, cheaper hobby type of CNC machines are designed to take Gerber files, I, th I think that's the pronunciation, um, and oth others like an industrial milling machine will want what's known as G-code. Now a lot of the software will only produce the Gerber files so if you're using software that does that then you need some additional software <laughs> that converts the Gerber files into G-code files. Now I've looked at several uh, different uh, programs in order to decide uh, which ones I would like to use to go through that process. Uh, now uh, one that you can get a free version of this which is just limited in the size of the printed circuit board and maybe number of components you can put on it but it's it's quite a high limit so it's probably not limiting for too much which is called Eagle. Now this has uh, one advantage uh, which is why I tried it in the beginning is that it goes from beginning to end. You can put a schematic in one end and you can get G-code out of the other end. You don't have to um, go through the process of converting the Gerber files into G-code files if you need them. It, it will also, for those who want the Gerber files, it will output uh, those too. Unfortunately, I just hated trying to use it. I didn't find it easy, intuitive or anything like that. After I wasted quite a bit of time on uh, trying to come to grips with that, I came across a forum on the internet uh, where they were comparing Eagle to a program called DipTrace and even people that had to use Eagle in their uh, general day-to-day -day work uh, would use DipTrace at home because they just didn't like Eagle too much. Now I'm probably going to get a torrent of um, co complaints about that with people who, who love Eagle and there are some but it's like with all software the best software is the one that you feel happiest with. Um, by coincidence, just before I saw that um, forum post, I'd come across a program called DipTrace and I started to use it and straight away I felt at home with it. It was much, much easier to use. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't output the G-code directly. A couple others that are in interesting. Oh, by the way, these all are f free software or have free versions of it. Uh, these two, Fritzing and Design Spark, are interesting because they will give you um, a 3D visualization 
of what your printed circuit board will look like with the components um, in, in place on it. Uh, fritzing is particularly uh, popular amongst those that are using um, microprocessors and micro controllers such as the Arduino and the Pi. Uh, there was an, another one I tried that was called Free PCB. It, it worked okay, uh, but I, I just didn't like the, the, the way in which you had to, to work with it. Other people would probably uh, love it. Uh, so anyway, the thing is here with these, you can either start off entering your schematic and go from there to um, the, the layout of components and then from there to the routing. That will apply whether you're going to do some etching, whether you want to print that out with a laser printer or print directly onto the circuit board uh, or even use a photographic technique. You'll still need some software like this to produce the masters that you're going to, to use. Um, as I mentioned, I, for my machine I need a G-code. These only put out the, the Gerber files and, and one or two other formats which are um, used by some of the services which will produce printed circuit boards for you. Uh, what I use for going from the uh, Gerber or Gerber files to G-code is a program called FlatCam. So with that it will take in the, the, the Gerber files. If I'm doing two-sided printed circuit board uh, there will be two separate files for the uh, copper etching on each side. There will also be a Gerber file for the, the, the drilling to control the machine and if you want it now uh, commercially on a, a lot of printed circuit boards uh, there will be some silk screen printing done with the names or reference to the components that go in that place and that's quite handy. Um, I, I don't bother with that but I know some people uh, that are doing it uh, at home like to have that. So you have files for the silk um, screen. Anyway, FlatCam will take in uh, th those files and output the G-code. It's not a straightforward process. I, I find what I would have thought would have been uh, automated within the software. Um, some things have to be done manually. Uh, for, for instance, you feed in the, the Gerber file and then it converts it into some other form. But to go to the next stage, you can't just continue, you have to go back, then select the, the, uh, the second form that's been done and then repeat that process before you get to the G-code. Um, it, it, it's just a little bit awkward, it doesn't take very long and once you're used to the, the, the workflow it's, it's, it's no big deal. There's probably some other software around that, that maybe is easier or more intuitive to, to use uh, but I, I, I don't know any, I haven't been gone searching for it because this does the job quite well. Another bit of software that's quite useful is a G-code simulator or viewer whereby you feed the software the G-code and then it will trace out, give you a visualization for what the printed circuit board will look like. Uh, the, the, there are several of those. Most, um, most controllers for a CNC machine will actually give you that sort of simulation after you've fed the file in, but I, I find it useful just to have a quick look at it to, to see what it's going to look like before I go and put it into the computer on my milling machine. Uh, one program that I use for that uh, visualization is called J Viewer. Now all these programs, if you search under these names on the internet, you'll find download links for them. Well that's it for this uh, video, I hope it was uh, informative, uh, please uh, like and uh, share it when you're finished and uh, if you haven't done so already please subscribe to my channel to get uh, notice of uh, future videos. Thanks for watching.